What sensation? Darkness. Why? She'd felt something like it before, under the hill, when they took her holy symbol. When they tried to separate her from Hellion. The misguided fools. They were so sure they knew what was right. They wouldn't listen. They didn't know the fear. They didn't believe in the real monster reaching out and reaching out and reaching out, stretching its unending metal fingers until they could wrap around the world and squeeze. But this was different. And so much worse. They were strong, but could they have really done it? Hellion was a god. He couldn't die. And yes, he was trapped in that imperfect shell, that body the enemy had built to be his prison, because it feared him. But he was so much more than that body. He was hope. He was a god. How could they kill him? How could they have had that kind of power? And how could they make the presumption? Mayanda sat in the darkness, staring at the floor of her cell. It didn't matter, did it? Hellion was dead. She was in the hands of still more fools, humans who thought they could take pieces of the source of the enemy and control them. They had no idea what was waiting for them, what was controlling them from below. Or perhaps they did. Maybe they, maybe those god killers in Torch, or the Technic League, or the Black Sovereign, or all of them, were working for the great enemy. Wittingly or not, working to further its plans and help it ascend to a throne beyond any of the old gods, a seat of power and destruction that would even put Rovagug to shame. Did they know? Were they tempted by some absurd promise of wealth and power? Were they blinded by their own ambitions, or their ridiculous pretend causes, or were they simply monsters? She stood up off the hard, narrow platform that passed for a bed and a chair. Her cell was tiny, less than ten feet by ten, next to featureless. They kept her in darkness all the time. There had been nothing to do in that silence but commune with her god. Now even that was gone. Mayanda hated every one of them. She didn't know if she could ever do anything about it. But she nurtured that hate just the same. And why not? There wasn't anything better to do. No one was listening. This is Pot Against the Machine. Pot Against the Machine. Welcome back to Pot Against the Machine, the Pathfinder actual play podcast where the cast is being slowly replaced by Keith David. All of us. I'm your host, and here's everybody. Howdy, Keith. Hello, fellow Keith. I would absolutely have Keith David do like play me in any version of my life. And people might be confused, but I don't care. It's Keith David. You just start every sentence with, I'm Izzy, and... <laughs> For those at home, I know who Keith David is now. <laughs> Yay. Proud of you. <laughs> That's why we didn't play for like six weeks. It's because I was off researching everything Keith David has ever done. <laughs> Keith David binge watch. It's like the uh, Lord of the Rings scene with Gandalf, but it's just you like looking through old, like the manuscripts where they live and stuff. <laughs> just slowly scrolling down IMDb and going item by item. <laughs> Watching every single thing. That's a lot of things. You'll be watching cartoons and video games for the rest of your life. I don't life. know if six weeks is enough to watch everything he's been yeah, in. Yeah, I was going to say, he's been in so many things. His IMDb page must be huge. <laughs> well, last time on the program, um, other than Keith David, our party reunited with uh, several people in um, Torch, starting with Connor Bain. Uh, they had a conversation with him at the Foundry, and then a second one at the Foundry, uh, where they... Um, brought them up to date on the Technic League, and he brought them up to date on the Technic League and Torch. After that, uh, the party split up, slept for the night. Uh, Kira broke into her own house, and um, in the morning, actually reunited with her family, had some um, hugs with some road dirt on everyone, and um, then, let's see, we had a... Uh, Brixby had a conversation with Garrett, where he convinced him to basically spread nonsense all over the gargoyle that's in town 
and Asher talk to Dinvaya about magically enhancing his gun. After which, I think everybody went to the town hall to talk to Dolga, but there was, um, there was a gargoyle there. And he was, um, you know, just doing some paperwork and totally ignoring them while they had a normal and not at all careful conversation. And then, as the party went to leave, he uh, told them to stop. I believe that's where we are now. I'd like to amend uh, he was playing that day's wordle. Deeply, <laughs> deeply invested. And didn't even notice until you're about to leave. It was pride. I wonder if it was Samantha, because he was really focused. <laughs> Every once in a while, he'd be like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he probably didn't look angry enough for Samantha, I think. Or he's just Googling the words that they gave him as hints. Like, I, what does depersonalization have to do with this horse? <laughs> Receptacle? Receptacle? <laughs> How is that number 77? I've used six hints already. <laughs> uh, Samantha, we would love to get together with you as a sponsorship. Um, we're huge fans. Huge fans. Brain hurt good. <laughs> so, um... As you're all in the council chamber at Torchtown Hall, Sassaduke stands up, knocking over his chair in the process, seemingly more because there's just no space for it around his legs than any sort of intent. The wings of this towering stony creature brush the nine-foot-high ceilings of this room. It actually looks like he's holding them kind of crouched down, lower than they would naturally sit, because uh, he's just too tall while the humanoid monster himself stands close to seven feet, and he looks even larger thanks to the suit of plate mail wrapped around him. Uh, He has a large, strange, greenish bastard sword hanging at his side, and he says, By the authority of the Black Sovereign and the Technic League, pursuant with Order 4714-26, I request that you identify yourselves. Hi, I'm Kira. These are my friends. Bye. Am I being detained, officer? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Vargas will uh, stand up and kind of bow to him and put a hand over his chest and say, Hello, I am Bron Mel of Clan Mountain Fist. Glory to the Black Sovereign. And then he'll sit back down. And his gaze will drift over to um, Asher and Brixby, who have not yet identified themselves. Um, Kira said they were her friends, so... Those aren't really names, though. Kira's friend one and Kira's friend two. Oh, hi there. Uh, uh, Brixby Redtail. That's, uh, with an R and an L. Yes, and well met, I am called Asher Halech. Oh, hello, all of you. I am Sazduk of the Starfall Guard, here as representative of... Kevath Kul, Sovereign Ruler of Numeria. Pursuant with Order 4714-48, you are required to identify that. And he raises a massive gauntleted hand and points at Kira's chainsaw, including where you obtained it and under what circumstances, along with any other technological artifacts on your persons. And, you know, his eyes kind of drift around the room, settling on each person um, in turn. We call him Ricky. It's like a play on words, but I sort of get the feeling you wouldn't understand it, just given the context, so um, trust me, it's really funny. Yes, he's so fine, he blows my mind. Uh, (laughs) We found that, in fact, in in Scrap Wall at the night market. uh, Where it came from originally is, is beyond me, but it's... Coming rather handy. What, just yesterday, I saw Kira cut a larger door around the door to the foundry. Mind you, not the foundry or the foundry, but... In any case, yes. I'll roll bluff. That's a natural 16 for a 23. I'm gonna roll his sense motive. Thought that was a d12 for a second there. Oh, that's good. So Keep it. Great. Fine. Hands off um, the chest piece. Hands off. <laughs> um, and he kind of narrows his eyes and goes, The night market, you say? And um, that? And he points at the um, goggles that Brixby's wearing. Traded for these fair with a couple of the denizens of the Darklands. Familiar with the dark creepers, dark stalkers. 
Oh. He <laughs> reaches over, grabs like a clipboard that he had on the desk, and um, a, a pen that looks like comically tiny in his <laughs> reading <his hand>. glasses. <laughs> Scribbles some stuff down. And he goes, "That was a uh, dark creepers, dark stalkers, any dark slayers." Um, yeah, for I'm not completing his purposes. I, I just I, I skipped um, the anthropology elective at uh, Cheddar Home Community, so I'm I'm not as good. Uh, but I, I do know that it was uh, in the order and law of fair exchange. And he frowns and he's uh, scribbling uh, stuff for uh, several seconds. He goes, and the um, the spear gun uh, and the uh, robot arm. How about those? Well, I don't think that's very polite. My arm is actually not technological based. I'm a uh, what's known as a Jiskin artificer. It's a magical construct. Mm-hmm. He frowns at that one. He goes, "Don't see a lot of magical constructs around here. Pretty convenient, if you ask me." Vargas uh, will say, "I lost the original arm in a battle during the war in service for the Black Sovereign. I traveled far and wide in order to." learn to make this replacement. If you like, you can examine it to prove that it is not technological. And uh, he will hold the arm out, and technically nothing he's saying here is a bluff. Like, it, he's not technically lying, but he is twisting the truth, so I don't know if you want me to roll bluff or not. Um, I don't think you need to, because you're, you're not really lying. I think he is going to take just like a step forward and sort of squint at the arm, like looking for wires and things. I'll just roll a perception see how well he can tell. Uh, after like a few seconds of just like looking down at Vargas's arm, he goes, oh, very well, uh, the the Black Sovereign thanks you for your service. And the, the spear gun, is that some sort of magical non-technology gun? Or is it some purchase from some underground society or... what What is it? Well... To be honest, I've I've only handled it for a short time. I'm not sure if you're aware of the Scrap Masters Arena in Scrapple, but we had a bit of a lark and an arena fight there, and as we were victorious over our opponents, uh, we were able to partake of their equipment. It's a bit of a second-hand purchase, at least. Um, he writes, like, a little bit more notes, and he goes, oh. Thank you very much for your cooperation in this regard. Do you have any other technological items or artifacts uh, to declare at this time? Kira pulls out a glitter glue gun. This is how I write all of our names on our stuff so we don't lose it. And then we'll like shift slightly. You can see property of Kira Smythe on uh, the chainsaw. His name is Ricky. And that is uh, from Michael's craft store or? From, from Joanne's. You can tell from the quality. And, uh, oh, we sure nice. can. <laughs> <laughs> Niceness of it. <laughs> and uh, anything else? Uh, I will say, sir, while we don't have any other technology, I have heard that there is a gentleman in town, a uh, bleachling gnome by the name of Garrett Burwaddle, who may have knowledge of important technological discoveries. I think if there's anyone here you should talk to, he's at the top of that list. Isn't that right, everyone? Very much so, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I might need a bluff check on that one. Oh, no. You know, can I help? <laughs> You're going to say, I'll aid someone. <laughs> yeah, I can uh, aid. Or probably. do I have to be the main one because I said it? <laughs> Gotta be. Kind of felt like your bluff. Yeah, I, th- I think it's Vargas's bluff, but you can be aided by his companions. Oh, God, please tell me you guys all aid. Uh, that is a zero. Oh, so... <laughs> no aids will matter. <laughs> oh, no. Well, plus uh, two. I have a minus four to bluff and I rolled a four. Oh, so dear. we're starting at a zero. I do aid exactly with a ten. I should have let someone else say that. Yeah, I... So that's three a six. Aids. All right. A total yeah, of a six. six. Solid. Yes. 
Um, his eyes narrow, and he says, I, I'm familiar with Mr. Burwaddle, and I don't appreciate any funny business. I run a tight ship here. I'm watching you, guy whose name I can't remember. He looks at his notes and realizes that he didn't start writing stuff down until after you'd already introduced yourselves. You must keep yourself rather busy with your maritime administration and your patrols about the town. If there's anything we can do to help, we're, of course, uh, happy to do so while we're here in town. I don't imagine we'll be here too long, though, just passing through. And uh, where is it that you're going after this? Well, I'm a bit of a wanderer myself, you know. I'm not even from this continent. Just came here to see the sights of Numeria. I may just go wherever the road takes me. You gonna roll a bluff check? Or is Asher really not committed to going anywhere specifically? He... That's fine. I mean, he is a, bit a wanderer not from this continent that traveled here to Numeria. Everything he said was true for the most part, but I'll roll a bluff. I'll help. And I'll help. Okay. It's shake and bake. So it's a 19 before any aids. I also aid. No, I didn't roll to aid, but Asher seems fine. <laughs> yeah, I did not aid, by the way. I rolled another four. So 21, <laughs> then, with Brixby's aid. No, he nods and says, um, very well, uh, I do thank you for your cooperation. I do just have one more question for you, and it is an important one. Pursuant with Order 4714-1, do you have any known business associates slash friendships slash other relationships, be they personal or otherwise, with any feminine presenting androids? I mean, I admit, you know, we didn't get along well, but we did have an encounter with with one that we found wandering in town named Mayanda. That's the only feminine presenting android that I have ever met. And the rest of you? Yes, she, uh, I, we also met her as well. She was not a very pleasant person, but from what I understand, your captain has already dealt with her. So we thank you on behalf of uh, all of our townsfolk for helping us out with that rogue android and doing your job of keeping us safe from technology. Good job. <laughs> and he nods and writes a little bit more down. He goes, oh, very well, though. Thank you for your time. You may continue with your day. People whose names I forgot to write down. <laughs> Bye. And he'll, he'll wave and sit back down. And Dolga, who's been looking rather nervous in the background, sort of ex exhales after holding her breath that entire time. <laughs> Waves goodbye to the lot of you. So will see you at dinner. Ah, uh, yes, I'll, I'll see you there. Great. Yes, take care now. And I sure will tip his mm -hmm. hat and just casually exit the town hall. McGargoyle. <laughs> <laughs> Maris will say, uh, again, glory to the Black Sovereign, and step outside and then immediately start, like, gagging as soon as he's out of view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was some real acting by Vargas. <laughs> Nailed it. Boy. I think you know a guy. Skill focus <laughs> bluff. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Bring that to a negative one. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, the trick is you don't lie. You just say stuff that isn't uh, 100% right, and then the GM won't make you do a bluff check. Well, I tried, and he still had me, but that's fine. I'll, I'll get over it. So what do we want to do, gang, before we, we have dinner? What's next? Clearly swing by Charlie's. <laughs> Clearly. Yeah. Popping by Charlie the Lizard, folks. Gotta get that chicken. Another... <laughs> yeah. Right? That's true. Yeah. Uh, Izzy raises a good point. Has another one moved in in the interim? Does he have competition? Is there another place we should check out? Of course not. It's also called Charlie's, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie's, but it sells something different. Yeah. No one would ever dare um, try to compete with Charlie the Lizard Folk after um, the Chicken Wars of forty-seven twelve. Um, we don't talk about what happened in <laughs> the Chicken Wars, but Isger will never be the same. <laughs> oh, well, there's a a line outside Charlie's, of course, because you know it's the most popular place in town. Um, but 
We just flash so our punch card. <laughs> we use the hero's entrance. <laughs> oh. Ah. The aforementioned fast pass. I don't remember if that was before we started recording or not, but the uh, Charlie's fast pass. Well, I feel like with how they treated us in terms of discounts after we saved the town, the hero's entrance probably has a longer line than the regular <laughs> entrance. <laughs> It's more that the prices are higher. Yeah. They're like, you're heroes. You can afford this. <laughs> they know how adventuring works. But I think uh, eventually, you, if you get to the front of the line, uh, you see the cheery halfling. He goes, hello, I'm Charlie the Lizard Folk. <laughs> what can I get for you? Um. Yeah, uh, can we get two number ones? Um, let me get a side of small fries. Two biscuits and then kids meal. Kids kid, meal. Kids. I want a kids meal. Do you want apple slices? It's, it's not for me. It's for. It's for me, and I want apple slices too. Kids, yeah. kids meal with the apple slices. Thank you yeah. so much. Do you want the the peanut butter with the apple slices? Yes, please. We we oh. try and focus on protein. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, we have a limited time promotion. Uh, we uh, with every meal purchased, you get a free chunk. Tube. You know what? Never mind. I'm good. I'm not hungry. I'm suddenly hungrier. Describe this more, please. <laughs> now, chunk tubes are an, an experiment of mine. They're, they're like goo tubes, but uh, we make them in-house. So, you know, they're, they're nice and chunky. It's like a, a slurry of like beets and birdseed all mixed up in a tube. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I would say if I had one critique of the goo tube is that it is too homogenous a mixture. Well, that's what I was thinking. That's been my point since the beginning. Yeah, this is for, like, the cottage cheese crowd. <laughs> you know what? I will take a beet tube chunk. A beet... A, a tube full of beet chunks, yes. <laughs> Four of those. Well, they already come free with your meal, so you already got them. Yes, Great. the borscht blast. You want more? Mm. Four is good. <laughs> All right. Anything else I can do for you? Are we also here to get live chickens today? Oh, yeah, no. She ordered number ones. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> yeah, and he'll bring them out, and they're, like, in little dog carriers. Um, <laughs> but they're in, the like, like, the cardboard box ones uh, with all the <laughs> Charlie the Lizard folk branding all over them. Thank you. And then order <laughs> fries, uh, kid's meal, apple slices, and some chunk tubes. <laughs> And Vargas gets uh, two number nines, a number nine large, a number six with extra dip, a number seven, two number 45s, one with cheese, and a large soda. So that is a video game reference that nobody here is probably going to get. Sure didn't. <laughs> no. I thought at first that you were going for a Tenacious D reference. but No. Uh, GTA San Andreas. No. I, I, I haven't heard anything the last three minutes. I've just been imagining a large rat eating apples dipped in peanut butter. That's mm-hmm. that's all I can't get out of my brain. It's <laughs> adorable, kind of. I guess. How big is the rat? Uh, five, so three. Big. five, like five three. <laughs> three feet six inches. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say forty pounds. I think we. No, sixty-five <laughs> pounds. I'm sixty-five pounds. Oh. I'd be encumbered, but I can handle it. It's like pizza rat on steroids. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, pizza rat started getting his protein. Yeah, no, that's much healthier pizza rat on fiber so we pick up our number one which of course is the schrodinger special we don't know if the chicken is alive or dead that's why it's in the cardboard box as you said sam <laughs> it'll it's be perfect a for <laughs> dinner parties like this yeah we don't know until we open the box i imagine the box is magical cardboard so that we couldn't hear or feel any movement or sounds or anything that might spoil <laughs> or smell a roasted chicken. Yeah. They're like single use bags of holding um, where they do have air holes, but um, <laughs> there's still an extra dimensional space inside. Oh, and also, anyone who's uh, ever kept birds knows that even smart birds and chickens are not exactly smart, but even smart birds, if you put them in the darkness, they just assume it's night and go to sleep. Yeah, just throw a blanket over the cage <laughs> and they're, they're all tuckered out. We've got some really good content so far this <laughs> like that's, yeah. that's a great it Solid up. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
All right, so you've got chickens. You've got um, some time left today. I don't know if you were looking to do any shopping or anything else around town, or you want to kind of fast forward to dinner. Well, we didn't really have a lot of time between this episode and the last one to actually settle on what it is that we're buying, so... I didn't have time. I was watching everything Keith David ever did, but you all have no excuse. As we all know, no time has passed, so... No time has passed. passed. We should spend all of our gold on things to to boost Vargas's charisma. Like a circle of persuasion... You know, let's yeah, just go persuasion now. plus five. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he just puts it on, and just rue shows up on his cheeks. <laughs> the problem is, that would still only get me up to a twelve. That's not terrible. Oh, that's great. Right now, you're at like a three. Oh, he's 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 back up to a nice uh, round seven. Did we need to formally request Asher's gun upgrade? Oh, um, you were I, I think already, we already that asked. Her. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. yeah, we did ask her. So I'm assuming that means if we happen to uh, get ambushed by uh, the gargoyle down in Dark Alley, Asher canonically does not have his best gun with him right now. He's got the that light master hammer. Rick pistol is not there. Just have yeah. uh, twelve other pistols. <laughs> well, seven <laughs> broken them. pistols, one and one f- and three functional pistols, one on each holster, one in my bag. We still have Mianda's little laser blaster too. Or did we get rid of that? Not, not if Sazaduke's listening, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure for advanced weapons, we have the EMP gun, the the grappler, the, the grenade launcher, and that's it? Yeah, I, can't I, remember I think we actually we sold the Inferno pistol. I think we did. I think we might have sold it because I think it wasn't that good. Yeah, it's terrible. It's kind of crappy. It used the same ammo as the healing guns too, didn't it? Yes, it yeah. uses nanites. Yeah. It's like they didn't want you to keep yeah, it. Yeah, which isn't great for the damage it does. Yeah, If it did, like, laser rifle damage, I could understand that, but for what it did, that was not worth it. Zach, do it. <laughs> okay, so we are getting um, a headband of alluring charisma plus two for Asher. We are getting a belt of constitution plus two for Kira. Everybody is getting the Dusty Rose Prism Ion Stones. Yep. And then uh, two of us are grabbing Lesser Talismans of Beneficial Winds. And uh, Brixby is grabbing some Boots of the Cat. Got the the mouse and the cat boots. Which I think canonically have uh, a heel in them, too. <laughs> so Brixby is going to look great in his new boots. Aw, adorable. He's so tall. Uh, a great deal of comfort and art support while also making the wearer appear a little bit taller than normal. <laughs> comfort and arch support. Yeah, high sold. Now, Brixby is not morally opposed to um, wearing boots of the cat. Oh, they're made of cats. That's why Brixby's wearing them. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. I'm sorry to everyone in our Discord. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're just going to edit it out. But every every step he makes, it meows, uh, <laughs> which really kind of counteracts the stealth. That's great. I can have Kingsley in the room while I'm recording from now on. I'm just like, oh, those boots again. <laughs> it's just Brixby. All right. Well, I assume based on the length of time that that shopping conversation took, that that basically ate up most of the day, mm-hmm. most of the morning slash afternoon. Mm-hmm. Um, so anything else you want to do before dinner at the Smith family part two? Uh, while we're out and about asher would kind of do a gather information check he's just curious to see if anybody's seen or heard from nick shario in the last couple weeks mark give me that diplomacy roll that newly enhanced diplomacy (laughs) roll. i'm gonna need it because i rolled a seven so that's only a 20 and uh why don't you roll that d4 to see how long this takes all right i got all day (laughs) asher misses dinner one, baby, rolling low. <laughs> oh, man, Asher didn't spend the whole evening hounding townsfolk. Where is she? I was going to make that same joke, Jeff. I'm sorry. It's fine. Well, I think that with the 20, you ask around and um, definitely get a sense from quite a few people that she just hasn't been around. You know, there are people who've been at the former Silver Disc Hall, people who've been at all of 
Garmin's old holdings or Jarman's old holdings, and nobody has seen her. Uh, so it looks like wherever she went, she didn't come back to Torch. One of the people Asher asked was definitely not Nick Shariel with a fake mustache. <laughs> yeah, wearing glasses and a fake mustache. I've never heard of her. <laughs> yeah, it's specifically like the uh, cheap little store Groucho Marx ones where the mustache is attached to the glasses oh, yeah. and there's no glass in them. <laughs> <laughs> she sounds pretty cool based on what you say, but I uh, have no idea. Well, thank you for all your information. So, um, yeah, I think after a day of, of shopping and, of course, reconvening with people and hounding townsfolk who... Asher just suddenly pops up uh, around a corner and screams in their face, Where's Nick Shario? <laughs> they soil their pants accordingly. Um, dinner time arrives, and you've, you've got your boxes of chickens. Do we need to roll to see how the chickens are doing? <laughs> um, no, the, the chickens are fine. The decision right. was made when you ordered the number one. <laughs> <laughs> The chickens are canonically alive, and um, of course, when you get to the Smith house, Lightning Face is running around out back. Um, Yes. Just just have a growing number of chickens at the house. Yeah, he he has like a little cape. um, Oh, yes. (laughs) That (laughs) Kira's brother made him, and he's just going... (laughs) Well, once they have these two more from these boxes, and the one from one of Vargas's orders... They could actually have their own VC4, violent chicken four, that just solves all of the problems around Torch. And that's what we're doing for episode 100. And I'm cutting this out because they can't nope. know. <laughs> I have a TTRPG somewhere, a one, maybe it's one or two pager, of where you do play as a chicken. Oh, uh, it's perfect. I just had to dig it up. Nice. We step in and deposit the chickens in the back with the uh, with the initial chicken. And of course, all chickens are very good at staying within fenced yards, mm-hmm. even though they can fly for short distances. But uh, I think Dolga's beaten you here because uh, she snuck out, snuck over straight after work. And everyone is like all greetings and hello and lots of hugs for Kira. And I don't know if anybody else gets hugs. <laughs> they don't really know you that well. I mean, Asher did that cultural dance the last time that I thought endeared him <laughs> so heavily. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> You'll never forget it, Jeff. I see that look on your face. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, is that the dancing guy again? That's so weird. Is uh, Saduk also here because uh, he invited himself to dinner and, and uh, Dolgo was too polite to not? <laughs> Just sticks his head through the window? No, he would never. He would never invite himself to dinner. He's off Pursuant to order 4714-489, <laughs> I am always invited to dinner. <laughs> it is the tradition of the Starfall Guard to eat hungry man dinner sitting in a dark room <laughs> by oneself. Those lukewarm mashed potatoes. <laughs> it's fine. Don't worry about me. No one worries about me. Swanson cares, man. <laughs> So I think uh, Dolga will come over when all of you are in there and have finished exchanging pleasantries, and she'll say, Well, I'm sorry that we sprung that little surprise on you, but um, you you handled yourselves well. Yeah, how's work? Um, It's a little bit stressful with a certain oversized new friend looking over my shoulder, but he hasn't been terribly intrusive so far. He's just... Asks a lot of questions. Do you know how long he's going to stay? I haven't the foggiest. He hasn't said anything, but I assume there's some order that would specifies the length of time. He probably has it on one of his papers there. Does he take those with him? Or does he leave them there by chance? No, he he um, takes all of those with him. He has uh, boxes, I believe, and he's staying in one of the... the boarding house cabin cabins i assume he has it all locked up there but mostly from what i've seen it's statements he's accumulated from the people in town what about yeah, the same sort of things he asked you he's asking about technological items he's asking about an android he's 
been quite pointed on that subject, just asking people where they've traveled and what they do for a living, that, that sort of thing. Very mundane questions for the most part, other than the ones about the technological artifacts. Has he asked anyone anything specific about when the torch went out? No, but uh, Gartone asked plenty of questions about that when he was here. How did it go? Did any of the townspeople tell him what really happened? Well, I, I told him some. I told him that uh, it was out for several days, I believe two weeks, and uh, that we had um, a few groups try to enter into the torch, and um, we had several casualties, and it turned out that Mayanda, the android prisoner, was at the heart of it. She had disrupted some mechanism inside. I, I gave them that much, and it, he didn't seem terribly interested in the extent of the facilities inside the hill. I think it's always been understood that there was something there that seemed to satisfy them. They didn't even ask how to get in. They didn't ask about the small Mount Rushmore-esque facade of our faces that we had carved into the side of the torch. Oh, I, I believe that monument speaks for itself. It's incredibly artfully done. I didn't realize it was enchanted with the capacity of speech. That's quite an impressive feat. <laughs> Does it get all of our voices right, or is it just an approximation? No, it, it's all just impressions that people have done of you, but some are better than others. I'm quite intrigued to hear Sam do those. <laughs> I would say, turning to Vargas, I'm not sure, I'm worried as much about what people have to say inside Torch as uh, what Mayanda might give up. I don't know a good deal about the androids. I don't know if they can take information from inside. I know she wasn't the most cooperative, but I also know that they technically have a habit of finding what they want to know, no matter what. Yes, and we didn't exactly part with her under the best circumstances. She could very well tell Gartone everything she knows just to get back at us for stopping her plans. At the same time, Asher says, snooping, listening in, we, uh, we spared her life when we could have killed her. That may be worth something to her. She may perhaps not speak ill of us or speak of us at all. Also... What was the timing uh, as far as, like, when did Gartone leave with Mayanda versus, like, when did, was that before Hellion was defeated? Yeah, like, did we pass him coming in, or was he already gone? Uh, he was gone before Hellion was defeated. Bummer. I was really hoping to see if that had any effect on her. Yeah. Oh, yeah, she would have, like, felt it when he got... Yeah, since she was a, uh, what you're called, a priestess of his. Mm -hmm. yeah, she definitely, um, theoretically at least, would have lost her divine spellcasting. Yeah, like what happened with, uh, what's his face? Uh, Aslanti McGee. Yeah, uh, Aridin. Aridin. Aslanti McGee is also acceptable. <laughs> I <laughs> yeah. will take that one. That was this given name. <laughs> yeah, I think we should strip him of the um, honorific since he was kind of a jerk. Um, and Bring back his Lanty McGee. His Lanty McGee. Mm -hmm. Dolka, do you have any advice for us? Uh, we don't intend to stay in Torch very long, but we want to keep a low profile. Well, I, I think you conducted yourselves uh, about as well as could be expected. He hasn't been aggressive in any way, and as long as you're not drawing attention to yourselves with any other technology or... Um, if you have any devices he didn't see, uh, I think we, we should be fine. And I, I'm hoping that he simply loses interest in this town uh, before too long. But obviously, if we make ourselves more interesting with any action of sorts, that it'll delay his exit. Does he hold some regular office hours at the town hall? Uh, he's been um, spending the, the normal working days, and usually he, he stays longer than I do. 
every working day, and I, I'm not sure what he does on the weekends, but I would assume he goes back there and works. Hmm. Seems to be something of a regimented fellow. No, Doka, weekends are for the boys. Just looks <laughs> off into the distance. <laughs> yes. Season three now streaming on Amazon Prime. Uh, perhaps while he's at work at Town Hall, maybe time to just see if we couldn't you know, provide some room service, as it were, fresh towels to his domicile. Yeah, I bet if he's all by himself and just eating those hungry man dinners, there are plastic cartons littered everywhere. The boarding house that Sandville stayed at? Not the same yeah. physical one, but the same establishment. Yeah, he's in one of those um, cottages over there. There's a series of, like, nine of them. Okay, cool. Yeah, the little bungalows. What was the name of the one that owned those? Uh, we met him, didn't we, when we went and snooped around Sandville's place? Bungalow Bill. Uh, Agrin Most. I, I don't know if we ever said his name officially on the show, but it is. That might be why I couldn't remember. We might have just talked to him and never asked him what his name was. Well, if we said what his name was, it was a year and a half ago. So. <laughs> it was only in the one episode. I like Bungalow Bill. Thank you. We should just call him that regardless. I just wonder what he killed. Sam of, um, if, mm, totally just forgot his name, Dukes of Hazard is like walking around the town interviewing people or like summoning them to his lair. Like, it sounds like he spends most of his time in the office. I guess I'm trying to get at if we if we go over there, is he going to be like, oh, I was just interviewing Bungalow Bill? Um, I mean, I think from what you've heard, at least, um, he was more walking around before, and now he's kind of been sequestered in the office. Compiling notes. Okay, great. Yeah. Now that he has all of his good, good information, like who does what when. I like to imagine that everyone else is sitting down to eat. And we have all refused to take our spots at the table. We're just huddling, huddling, discussing local politics. Just hanging out over by the front door while the family's like just staring at you. Just a second, Mom. Curious family just keep exchanging looks at each other like, are, are, are they coming? Like, how many signatures does he need on that clipboard before he'll leave us alone? <laughs> We're like, yes, we support Order 4715 31. Please leave. <laughs> They invited the mayor, and none, none of them are sitting. <laughs> <laughs> this beat is getting cold or hot. <laughs> I like the idea of the the hot beat dish getting cold and the cold beat dish getting hot. <laughs> We're just, reaching room temperature. The cold beat dish somehow heats up. Everything's ruined. <laughs> All right, that seems like enough business then. Uh, I, I feel rude not involving the rest of the dinner party in our game of charades it's always been my accent it's true well if you head into the um dining room they've got like a little extra table added on like a kitty table where um toby will be set up and maybe a spot for bricks there too because you know the chairs are a little bit higher so you know makes sense i appreciate it (laughs) Um, they got everything all um, laid out. Looks like you got kind of a puff pastry sort of beet strudel this time. Everybody has their own <laughs> specially made portion, you know. Very dill forward. Now, I mean, I didn't think a thing would hold a candle to your beet loaf. But this <laughs> beet strudel is just... <clears throat> all right, thank you. We've worked long enough. The flavor on the beet arugula is... <laughs> Second to none. You know, very few people appreciate all the different varieties of things you can do with a beat. Of course. We've been saying it for years. Nature's candy. <laughs> it's a Doug reference for anyone who is as old as I am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Bingleman or whatever the heck his name is. Mr. Uh, Dink. Purple guy. Double income, no kids. <laughs> That's what it stands for. That's what I loved about that. Mm. And this is some killer tofu. <laughs> Such a good show. The first show that made me realize I could wear the same clothes pretty much every day. That's all I remember from that show is that the uh, that his best friend is green, and he had the same Skeeter. closet things. Skeeter. Skeeter, mm-hmm. Skeeter was blue. Yeah, Roger was, green. was green. Who was his antagonist? The bully. I okay. I mean, I would call it a dark teal, and Ju- obviously Judy. That was goals when I was five. <laughs> So what's the second course, Sam? 
I only had the one thing <laughs> written down. <laughs> but of course, a beet green salad with um, with golden beets, so we have a little bit of color contrast. It's not always purple. Go Tigers! As an LSU alum, I'm here for the purple and gold. Yeah, well, you got to have purple things and orange things because because beets. Those, that's our colors. <laughs> the colors of beets. The colors of beets, and now people know where the podcast colors came from. Always has been. <laughs> it's been beets the whole time. <laughs> Those orange beets. Oh. <laughs> and of course, uh, dessert is a, a chilled chunk tube for each person. Ooh. Okay, so just really quickly, like what what kind of seeds are we talking? Like it's like a mix. Like Chia. how edible are those by humans? Uh, what the the chunk tube? Yeah. Okay. So we said it's a what an emulsion. Is that what we called it? Oh, it's what they do with the giblets at the the Charlie place. That's they need a use for them. So oh, okay, well, that's terrible. Inside the tube. Oh no! No, nope, can't do that. I thought it was beets. How could you even make that joke? You're a vegan. It's a beet base. And I think that it varies what they mix in with the beets. Yeah. So it's sort so of it's like, like a beet flurry, and then there's like various uh, <laughs> other M&Ms. things put in yeah. to make the chunkiness. It's okay. like a McFlurry yeah. with room temperature beets and whatever they aren't using from the chicken. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, Every time I am almost on board. <laughs> it, or what they were going to feed the chicken. Mm-hmm. Fair. Or um, if they have goo tubes that people didn't finish, you, you know, to squeeze out that little there. extra bit, Ooh. mix it in. It's like a dock dumpling. This is revenge for the cottage <laughs> cheese conversation. So hungry five minutes mm-hmm. ago. <laughs> <laughs> the best thing about the chunk tubes, too, is I'm sure you've probably heard of the mother sauce thing where someone has some, like a mole that's been going for like 50 years, years or a sourdough yeah. starter. That's mm-hmm. exactly how the chunks yeah. first came about in the first place. It's it's really you can taste our history. That's what they say here at, at Charlie's. <laughs> Charlie's chunk stop. <laughs> yeah, it's just one one beat that they just keep taking cuttings from and sprouting. Now the weirdest part is this is a new history. food item they had, but it still came from a fifty year old them preserving the uh, Yeah. <laughs> they were apparently just saving that up for no reason before now. Well, I think that um over the course of dinner there there's lots of like small talk and you know friendly banter but i think uh kira's parents in particular sort of avoid the topic of any further adventuring rather pointedly so Um, yikes well you know parenting parents gonna parent even with the chainsaw idling the entire (laughs) dinner sitting she has it on her back while she's sitting there rattling just running quietly slowly cutting through the back of the chair (laughs) i was gonna say she sawed through two chairs already hold on sage let me cut that for you no no really it's totally okay please don't i'll serve that was my favorite plate you can have another one in fact do you have another one i'll go get one what time you carve you one with the chainsaw (laughs) just makes a plate out of table there you go (laughs) <laughs> yeah asher would uh at one point kind of when the the small talk has died down just uh look to cure his mom and say mrs smith i i wonder you've talked about your past explorations and adventures have you by chance been by or to Idenvay? i'm rather curious it's somewhat of an anomaly compared to the rest of numeria and she thinks for a second and it's Says, um, oh, yes, I, I, I was in Idenvay uh, quite some time ago. There, quite a bit of use for rangers out there, so I spent um, some time. <laughs> some of the only decent hunting in all of Numeria. But it, it's it's been quite a while. What is it that you um, want to know about it? Did Did you want any souvenirs from there? Like, if we were to happen to stop by. <laughs> narrows her eyes with the very, you know, suspicious mom look. Just something to keep in mind. Asher, what were you saying? I was more curious about you know, what the people are like and what the area is, is like. We've, If you happen to have any friends there in town still, that if I, just me, you would kind of shift his eyes, was to adventure, no, not adventure for sure, wander... <laughs> Rather aimlessly towards Iden Bay. Is there somebody I couldn't drop in on? Um, 
she thinks for a second. She goes, well, it's, it's a strange place. Very. They're very, very into uh, Arasta there and um, very anti-technology, like um, kind of the opposite of the Technic League where they don't want you to have technology because they want all of it. These people, they want all the technology gone sort of thing, like in a semi-militant sort of way. But generally, I, I would say not not the most trusting of, of outsiders, but they, they'll come around to a stranger if they don't show them any reason not to. And um, there were, I'm trying to think, there were strange fellows that always fighting what were their names she looks at Caden and he sort of shrugs like I wasn't there I don't and uh, she goes um it's, they're twins they were twins um Thelpin and Kifkin they they were weird weird men they're druids and they, they never got along with anyone for very long they're sort of I don't know that there'd be a point to seeking them out. They're the sort that are quick to take offense and uh, slow to forgive. Um, but uh, the, the characters, I'm not sure I, I remember anyone else from out there. Um, Wait, they fought uh, each other or they fought everyone else? Oh, they're just constantly bickering and, and, they've, and they would be your friend for ten minutes and then they'll uh, be in a rage of some perceived slight or... Or other, and this may be more a question for Dolga, but do we have any devotees of the bow father here? Anybody uh, close with the Church of Arastal? Um, no one I know of. We're definitely more of a bry town here, and of course, we have the Farazman sect. Um, you can check with Father Radley if he knows anyone because, uh, the worship of Phrasma is fairly universal. People die everywhere, but I'm, I'm not sure we have any Rastilians Ar here. I have a question uh, both for Dolga and for yourself. Uh, theoretically, you said they don't take kindly to visitors at first, but it is possible to win their trust. If someone had decided they wanted to come into town and just live there. How hard would that be for an outsider to come in and set up roots? Uh, I'd imagine uh, someone who worships a rastal would find it fairly easy, but um, on the other end of the spectrum, someone with a, um, say, a chainsaw uh, would find it next to impossible to make friends. And I'd, I'd say in between you would generally just be faced with uh, mistrust that would you'd have to slowly eat away at. Would it help if I turned it off? That <laughs> might help, but the sight of it, I think, would also, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's very obvious. It's it's huge, and <laughs> bright bright red and sparkly. And yeah, so it just, like, juts, like, four feet up <laughs> above her head. Like, I don't think it's that bad. Vargas, uh, continuing on his line of questioning from before, will say, say that it's someone who maybe would stand out otherwise uh, tattoos other oddities something that would mark them as not a native do you think they'd be able to blend in i would think it would um take them some time but perhaps if they stayed long enough they could and he's still uh to everybody else in case anybody's not quite sure he's still thinking like this android we're looking for basically went to ground there because that's still what I, the player, am thinking, like, that she's just pulled a Thanos and she's, like, out farming somewhere hoping nobody finds her. Spoilers. Thanos is in Numeria? That explains so much. <laughs> is there some other way we can get them to like us? Like, like if we go there and bring, I don't know, something that isn't live chickens. They're followers of wrestle they'd probably like live chickens more than anybody in this town <laughs> live chickens well and you mentioned that hunting is that's really one of the only places around the country where the hunting is good i imagine that there might be some perhaps not frequent but occasional travelers who are in town for hunting and might lodge there 
could be as reasonable of an alibi as anything. Yes, uh, I, I believe they, they had like a, a, a boarding house of, of sorts that travelers would use, and then there was um, one of the old townsfolk had essentially a large field. He would he let us camp there um, when my party came through for next to nothing, just as a, I think, a supplemental income for him. He was like a logger or something like that. But as far as the hunting goes, I mean, they have beasts of all sorts, but you know, Every so often they have a, you know, a, a mutated one or some, ones that are strange or oversized. So it's um, not immune to some of the strangeness we have in this country. We helped some of Vargas's friends kill a what, um, dragon thing? Dragon light. A little bit of a dragon. Wolverine. And then they, they didn't really want to be friends with us after, but you, we, you know, they were hostile to begin with. Well, if you did that for the folks in Idenvay, maybe they'd be, they'd like, you know, Killing a dragon thing if, if it was causing them problems, I guess. We have done that before. I mean, um, in a totally safe way that your daughter was doing um, other things during. Brixby, despite his like decent bluff, just can't lie to parents. <laughs> he just starts, he's sitting at the kid's table and he just like slowly lowers his eyes as he keeps going on with that <laughs> sentence. Yeah, we fought a dragon. He's got, like, the giant sweat drop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, it's worked for us in the past. It even helped us here, uh, turning on the torch, finding the missing townsfolk, and again with the black horses, and again in Scrapwall. I think if we ourselves want to be able to have any luck of searching around in Eidenvay once we get there we would need to ingratiate ourselves with the people helping them hunt like you say helping them with any kind of pests or predators something to get them to trust us so that we can and he kind of looks around do what we need to do there (laughs) Kira looks at her mom and just we call them big bag daddy points for no particular reason. <laughs> and not, not because we were being exclusive. We could have called them big bad parent points, uh, but it was it was a whole thing in Scrapwall, a very very interesting place, as you've mentioned. You're missing the context. Yeah, it was a very not gender specific daddy that we were <laughs> going for. D a d d i. Would Kira's mom know what big bad daddy points are since she fought in Scrapmasters? <laughs> I Arena racked before? up a couple of those in my day. <laughs> yeah, she probably had some big bad daddy points if she was fighting in the arena. She keeps them like like euros, like Americans keep euros from the one time they went to Paris or whatever. So I, I might have some back here. Yeah, we used to call them medium mean mommy points. <laughs> 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 the big bad Danny points expire as soon as you leave. But if those medium mean mommy points don't, why, I wonder if they've increased in value over time. I'm not sure what the conversion rate is, but um, regardless, so, um, you're planning on going to Idenvay then, and she'll turn her uh, face to look directly at Kira. Kira is um, studying the grain of the table. But this is really nice, nice work. This I had not noticed before how firm this table is. Yeah, compare it to the grain of the chunk tube. It's amazing. <laughs> Hopefully smears yogurt onto the table. What? Look at that. Um, and then we'll find, like, just take a breath and look at her mom. Just, I don't want to freak you out, but A, we were really really safe this first time and we did a lot of good work and and also I think there might be someone who can help me find my other mom and then I'll come back I I still want to be here with you but I can answer some questions and help those people and we'll be real real safe the whole time and I can send you a letter you like letters and she um clears her throat and um, puts her napkin down on the table and she says oh, well I would be a bit of a hypocrite if I said you couldn't 
go off and adventure England. I've yeah. just been telling you stories of, of my own, and uh, you did come back safe this time. It's, uh, With a chainsaw. Um, I'm always going to, to worry about you if you're out there, but I do, I, I trust you, Kira, to keep yourself safe. You're, you're going to be in profoundly huge trouble if you get yourself killed out there. Okay, deal. <laughs> I won't get killed. And I won't get in trouble. That's all I ask. Your daughter knows how to take care of herself. And you can see, uh, Vargas looks like he's kind of upset by the t this turn in this conversation, but he uh, continues on. She has proven herself to be a very competent adventurer, and you should be proud of her. There are many others her age, some even younger, who have tried the same thing and were not able to... Excuse me, and he uh, kind of just stands up with his uh, half-finished beat still on the table and just steps out into, I'm guessing, some other room of their house. And Kira will look at her mom and then at uh, Brixby and Asher. When he uh, goes into other rooms of other places, he might remove an arm, so I'm going to go check on him real quick because you should really see the stains in the foundry. I just... Uh, Gets up from the kids' table, scruffle on the boy. And I think with um, Vargas and Brixby going off in the other room and the um, family dinner having gotten substantially more awkward, <laughs> it's probably time for me to go to bed. It's a great place to, uh, like, ah, everyone's sitting at the table, or two, most of people are sitting at the table, like, <laughs> all right, uh, well, good night. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Sam. Good night, Keith. Good night, Keith. Hi, Keith. Good night, Keith. <laughs> we need a long intro to this one. Oh, against the machine. Against the Machine is property of Network Against the Machine, LLC, all rights reserved. Pathfinder and the Iron Gods Adventure Path are property of ISO Publishing. See their website for more details. The theme Against the Machine was written and performed by our own Zach. See the show notes for additional music and sound licensing. If you enjoyed the show, we encourage you to leave us a review. Hi. Hello, I am... Uh... Give me half a second. I'm trying to remember this name. <laughs> uh, Sorry. If we want to keep the jokes going, I'm no, sure Zach no, will. No, please help us. No, 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 no. For the love of please God, give us, real give us back on those rails. <laughs> <laughs>